FET is frozen embryo transfer. Today, almost all embryos are transferred uh, to the uterus after they've been thawed. So initially, embryos are frozen in a certain development stage. We often today are waiting for the uterus to recover from an IVF cycle, and then we transfer the embryo into the uterus in a more physiologic state. And the studies are pretty clear today that the pregnancy rates are about 15% higher when you transfer a frozen embryo to the uterus in a more physiologic environment. Frozen embryo transfers uh, have been done for many years. However, they become very, very popular today because the freezing technology has become much, much better in the past two to three years. So that today we can freeze an embryo and have it come out of the freezer and thaw and be of the same quality it did when it was initially fresh. This allows the uterus to recover from all the stimulation of the IVF cycle and enhances the implantation rates. Pregnancy rates are about 15% higher with frozen embryos. So the process of a frozen embryo transfer really starts with the beginning of a, a new cycle, the menstrual period. Generally, the patient will take uh, birth control pills for about two weeks to thin the lining of the uterus, get the lining very thin. And then it takes about uh, 10 to 12 days of oral estrogen tablets to rebuild the lining, uh, approximately where it would be at ovulation time. And then we add progesterone. After five days of progesterone, that is when we transfer the embryo because the embryos were frozen at about five days of growth. So it's that synchronization of the lining with the actual transfer of the embryo into the uterine cavity. Many ask about how to prepare themselves now for the transfer of the embryo into the uterus. Uh, we always recommend that the patient try to uh, set their schedule so there's less stress in their life around the, these several weeks to prepare the lining. And even after the transfer, not to have all the schedules and uh, maybe be able to have a light day at work, uh, have help with the kids if you have kids at home. Less stress is something that enhances one's uh, response to the treatment. We have many questions about diet. I don't think there's any particular food that is going to enhance the receptivity of the uterus, but the recommendation of uh, moderate exercise and, and good nutrition are always helpful in terms of preparing for pregnancy. Generally, they recommend uh, not uh, taking alcohol or caffeine, that it may have some effect on the uterine uh, contractility, the contraction of the uterine muscle. And that's why we give progesterone afterwards to keep the uterus in a more uh, quiet state. Following transfer of the embryo into the uterus, there's been a, a change in philosophy in the last few years. I think the studies are very convincing now that light activity after transfer is, is absolutely fine. Staying in bed uh, for two days is physiologically not beneficial and actually is, is, is probably not good for one's physiology. So we have patients that uh, can get up and have their meals and take a shower and walk around the house. We just don't want people going out and getting to stressful environments. The medications to prepare the line of the uterus uh, is estrogen, which is about for 10 or 12 days. It generally is an oral tablet, but it could be a patch or even injectable. Uh, and then after the lining is developed. It takes about 10 to 12 days to develop the lining with the estrogen. And then we add natural progesterone. And that can be a vaginal insert or injectable or a combination of both. After five days of injectable, that is when the embryo is transferred. And uh, then that is continued up till the time of the pregnancy test, which is about 10 days after transfer. You don't absolutely have to do injections. I think the studies uh, recently have shown that injections of progesterone give better progesterone levels for uh, almost everyone, that the pregnancy rates are a little bit higher with progesterone injectable. I don't think everyone needs it, but we can't really identify who needs it and who doesn't. So we really offer it to all our patients because the studies are pretty clear that the injectable is gives you the very highest pregnancy rates. Now, some women can't take the injectable. Uh, it's, uh, they re react to it in an adverse way. Then we use just the vaginal inserts. And again, the pregnancy rates with the vaginal inserts or cream have been very comparable to the injectable. The actual process of transfer is, is relatively simple. The hardest part is drinking water to fill the bladder. And everybody asks, why do you have to do that? Filling the bladder actually sort of straightens the angle of the uterus with the cervix so it's easier to transfer the embryo. It also gives us a better ultrasound picture of the uterine cavity. But once the um, 
bladder is full, the uterus is in a, a more horizontal fashion, we actually use a small plastic guide that goes through the cervix and into the uterine cavity. It's just about that far. And then once we have the guide in place, the catheter then is brought in, loaded with the embryo, and then the drop of fluid with the embryo is placed in the uterine cavity. The catheter is then removed, and uh, we check the catheter to make sure that all the embryos have uh, gone into the uterus. This really takes about five minutes. Uh, the patient then uh, is able to go home after about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. So it's a really a very simple process. Uh, the patient rarely feels any of the catheters. The hardest part is filling the bladder. So once we transfer the embryo, there's the long wait. It's about 10 days. Uh, at that point, we do the blood test, and that blood test is very definitive of whether the embryo has implanted. Again, there's another follow-up test. If there is a positive at 10 days, then we recheck the pregnancy hormone level two days later to make sure there's an appropriate rise. And then another five days after that. And then if those numbers look very uh, normal, the first ultrasound is done two weeks after the first positive pregnancy test. And that's when we look for the first signs of uh, fetal heartbeat. So once we have a positive pregnancy test, we follow up again and repeat that in two days. And then five days after that, again, we're looking at the rise of the pregnancy hormone level that tells us that the pregnancy is growing appropriately. The ultrasound is then done two weeks after the first positive test. And on ultrasound, we look for what is called a gestational sac. Uh, inside the gestational sac is a, a structure called the yolk sac, which is the beginning of fetal development. We also look for a heartbeat right at that time. And the fetal heartbeat starts between the sixth and the seventh week of the pregnancy. So if we don't have a heartbeat at week six, well then we repeat the ultrasound again at week seven. And then we look weekly after that to monitor the interval growth of the, the fetus. We do an ultrasound and blood test every week from week six, seven, eight, and nine to uh, monitor the growth of the pregnancy. And also right around nine weeks, we then are beginning to taper off the estrogen and progesterone because the placenta is then large enough and functional enough that it makes all the hormones necessary for the pregnancy. So by nine to 10 weeks, uh, the woman is ready to go off to her obstetrician for obstetrical care.